Hello. Nice to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Fredrik Sjöja, and with me? My name is Christian Runevik. And we will talk about how we support informed decisions. And uh, this is our, our thoughts, our journey, uh, when it comes to uh, data-driven decisions. But first, let us uh, show you some uh, market survey, some numbers. Uh, recently, this report came out asking people how they feel about automation. Do you feel confused or afraid about automation? And the result is I found, I found staggering. Engineers, 43% are afraid or confused about automation. But what is remarkable is top management. 99% are either afraid or confused. They know what automation is, and they're not afraid. I had a view that it should be the opposite. What do you think this is? I think people are afraid of automation because they see the risk that it's taking my job away. But no. Another report is saying that there are new times here. Before, in the, in the industrial age, we had the machines that was the creator of value when it comes to products or services. But today, in the age of global markets, it is humans that actually creates value. The machine helps us in that work. So we need a new balance. We need to understand that the machine can help us. They can connect us with our superpowers and create our inner visions of how we create value together. So we must be friends with the machine and see the machine or the automation as something that supports our natural intelligence. Natural intelligence in the sense of our human brains learning, doing stuff, figuring things out, asking new questions. And the machine and the artificial intelligence should help us in that, in that journey. And since we come from IKEA, let me just phrase the founder of IKEA, Ingvar Kamprad. Our objective requires us to constantly practice making decisions and taking responsibility to constantly overcome our fear of making mistakes. Which means taking decisions is a craft. It's something we need to practice as human beings. No decision can claim to be the only right one. It is the energy that is put into the decision that determines whether it's right. Exercise your privilege, your right and your duty to make decisions and take responsibility. This was a wise man. He knew that we need to think, we need to act, we need to do things, and we need to make, take decisions. We need to move on. But how do we feel about taking decisions? How do we feel regarding knowledge and data? I have a uh, connection, a professor at Stockholm University. Uh, we discussed a lot of the human brain and how we reflect on data and knowledge. He's a professor in, in, uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, Pedagogic. Sorry. Sorry, uh, I don't know the word. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, we discussed how, and the research is about uh, university students. University students, how they look upon knowledge when they grow and they mature during the university years. And there is actually research done that we can reuse and put in the context of the industry because people start with a dualistic view of knowledge. A lecturer is telling me what is right and wrong. In the end, we reach commitment. 
this is quite academic. So I work as a test architect, so I create models. I explain different advanced things through uh, simplistic models. So I want to illustrate this with personas. Okay, so we start in the lemmings stage. This is a dualistic view of actually someone is giving me directions and I follow them blindly. Then we start to understand that there is actually more than one right. I can listen to different kind of inputs, but then I take a decision based on gut feeling. This is the cowboy stage. This is the cowboy stage. And you have perhaps seen this in, this, in the industry where people ah, listen to a nice report. Uh, I understand the risks. Uh, nothing works. But anywho, we're going out to production anywho because uh, business said that they want the feature. But then something happens. People start to take responsibility for their own decisions. They are interested in data. They are interested in information, but they do not listen to anyone if they don't have data to back their story up. This is the, the trust no one stage, the x file stage. This is the C3PO stage. C3PO will tell you the odds of you screwing up, but he will not take a decision by himself. The le last stage, when you understand that there is data that I can use in order to support my decision, and I base my knowledge on data, and then I act, because you can't measure anything, everything. You can't measure everything. Can you guess what character? I was thinking about Indiana Jones, because he's a professor, and then he do stuff. But uh, the first uh, character I, I came up with, with, with Dr. Venkman, Ghostbusters. You know, they are professors, but they do stuff. They base their knowledge on data, and then they act. And how do we make people grow into the Ghostbuster stage. How do we connect people with their inner Ghostbuster? And of course, from a day-to-day -day basis, we, 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 uh, we iterate. Sometimes in the morning, we are, we are true lemmings. And sometimes in the afternoon, we, we are a Ghostbuster. But of course, we, have, we, we are not stuck in one state. but we must be aware of the different states and what decisions we make. So, we, ma we try to make people grow in their conscious way of making decisions. It's not if you took the right or wrong decisions, we want to focus on the way we make a decision. The IKEA context now. Yes, so this is where our little presentation really begins. Um, so I work for production at IKEA, and this uh, is where it all started. We have uh, 12,296 servers in Splunk at the moment, so we have every single log file we have at IKEA. In what, is together in Splunk. what is Splunk? It's a log collector, you could say, of sorts. So there is a few of them, but this one was available already and used by the security team at IKEA. And bec it became available for the rest of us users a couple of years back. So, and this platform, it gave us the possibility uh, and to, to capture logs. To capture logs and make them visible for more people than just the security team. Uh, so we could all of a sudden visualize uh, log files from production for our testers, and testers could also see all log files because they were cleaned and available for everybody to use. And since the uh, development landscape at IKEA is very large and complex and everyone develops in their own way, in their own uh, tool ecosystem, this is the common nominator. Yes. So the, the 12,000 servers is uh, spread across, I think, uh, 600 somewhat applications in uh, a couple of different data centers. But all the log files is available now in one, in one platform. One platform. And this gave us such 
lots of interesting metrics that we could gather so we can now monitor all servers, see all server metrics, response times across the board. Uh, we can start comparing environments. And this is where we got an idea, because now we had a data lake that already existed. What can we do about that data lake? How can we reuse this, this lake of data in other contexts, in other discussions? Because we still had issues. We still could just be reactive to when things blew up. We didn't know why, but we knew when it happened. And this is a typical example. We used uh, or we never have performance issues in our production environment, but sometimes it occurred. And we noticed this is our uh, production, uh, the transaction volumes we had uh, on one particular moment. But all the performance tests said things are fantastic. So we just adopted and uh, used the same search metrics for a uh, test environment. And we can see that we had an during the peak load test that lasted for roughly in one hour, we had 30 transactions per second. But in a day-to-day -day live environment, we had two and a half thousand transactions per second. And so this, this is a typical example of where we can use the data we have in our production environment to learn from our test environments and to try to improve, because this data is available then for everyone. As long as you have managed to get access to it. But, but it also gives us different statistics just from the logs. We can then monitor our entire business flow from when people put stuff into the basket, logins, uh, promote, use promote cards, delivery methods, and checkout. And we can also then see why do we have high response times. So different people can use the log files to draw different conclusions from it. And of course, operations, they don't act before something goes really wrong. No, when this one turns red, that's when we normally act. So, But from a business perspective, it is interesting to ask the question, why do our customers linger on in this state? How can we make their flow easier in order to create more purchases? And it was pretty much at this state we started to think about what if we apply more logs, if we start to create logs from different systems to try to combine them into Splunk. Because we already had all server metrics uh, and, and uh, from AIX, Linux, Windows, switches, pretty much everything when it came to log files was in the system. And we then thought uh, about adding other data, uh, synthetic data. So we have all planned deployments. We added that data into the mix to try to figure out, can we compare when the deplo deployments are actually planned for all our systems and to try to combine that with the rest of the data. Because our general idea was that we wanted to create these persons to Ghostbusters to talk about the data and have informed and valuable discussion based on data. And made it more easy to visualize it. If we could take it out of the different systems where not everybody has access to or know how to gather the data from the system, but instead use one system to visualize it in. And that was when we started to think about, we have the data lake with all the server logs and all server metrics that uh, the technicians need and want. But what if we start to add more, if we start to create log files instead? Yes, and gather more data. So then we asked ourselves the question, what kind of data do we actually need in order to take informed decisions as a development team? So we thought about making a model out from modern agile principles where we want to feel safe. We want to test the bare essentials. We want to add that test results into our data sets. We also wanted to combine it with monitoring, uh, data gathering from consumer behaviors, from server health, uh, anything that... that the production monitoring, yes. alarms, uh, customer incidents, internal incidents. Um, pretty much everything we could think of. And combine this in order to make us grow into the interesting stuff, the experimentation on what if. So we looked upon one project and we started to map what kind of tools do they actually use in their context. And it is in their tool ecosystem rather many. 
tools that they use where we could gather data from. Yes, we started with, from my perspective, from production, I was only interested in, or first most interested in deployments and incident problems. So when, whenever we have a deployment in our production environment, what happened? Can we measure it by the number of incidents? Because we already have the server log, so we know if CPU ran wild, memory ran out, etc. But how was the customers actually behaving? Or how did they feel like about the application? Uh, because normally that's stored away, that information in help desk and other areas, and it never reaches the technicians that actually handles the environment. So that was when it started. And then we tried to add our monitoring tools as well into the same uh, mess. So we got all the production monitoring available in Splunk, cleaned but still in Splunk and available for everybody to use. And then we started to think, why, why don't we add all tests as well in the same suite? So we wanted to adopt. So we wanted to have our automated deployments and our uh, unit tests from Selenium suites and JUnits OPI and JMeter suites running at the same time into the same. So we can have follow up on what test cases is actually executed because we know how it went in production. But if we can have all the test cases running at the same time as well into the same environment, we can also show and map what screwed up in production. Did we actually test it? So for each iteration, we can improve the test suite and the test. So and once we got this, uh, the incidents, uh, we have all the deployments when they happen below, and we have all the incident depending on the inf infrastructure events or alarm or infrastructure re restorations if we self figure out what went wrong, user service requests or user service restoration. So all mapped by time. And the same is we have above, we have all the end-to-end -end monitoring tools and the alarms that they create. So we can now at least in theory figure out if the deployment caused lots and lots of incident or not and see if it's mappable. So when a de developer commits a new code in production, he can see now my deployment is done. Now the lo uh, alarms come from, from the servers, and now people are starting uh, uh, making calls to help desk. So they can understand, now I made something wrong. But we also realized, uh, this is from uh, my system's test environments, uh, we have different kinds of response times uh, mapped over time, taken from the log files, but one of my environments has nothing because nobody has executed anything in the environment. And one of the biggest issues we have, or I think most people have, when they only test rarely, like once every three months, is that it's an environment issues why we have higher response times for this release than the previous one. And if we have no log files, we can't prove it. So that's when we started to think about we need to create log files in order to have something to use from a test perspective. Exactly. Now we could monitor stuff. We can actually get information into this data lake. We could explore the data. But if we do not create any movement in the environment, or if no one is testing, we don't have anything to measure on. So we try to fix that. So. In the analogy of the data lake, what if we send up a l lumberjack upstreams to create our own wood and send it back down? And this was the concept we started with, uh, Freedom Fries. So we had a little Docker cluster, and we created uh, JMeter instances, uh, Selenium, and SOAP UI instances to run the tests continuously across our environments to be able to monitor them. So it's a fairly simple uh, test suite, but it works pretty simple. So we name our test case in JMeter. We use a uh, Splunk token in order to push it uh, from Docker to Splunk, and then we run it. And the test case names ends up in Splunk as the uh, label. It's pretty small here, but a simple one, but it, uh, it does the job. And why? We started calling it Freedom Fries, was due to a uh, developer, John. He said that this is great because it's totally free, and it's open, the data is open, and you can fry up any server 
which I did the first time yes. I tested it. But yeah. So that was the accident. And but since we use Docker, uh, we're not dependent now on ordering new servers or anything. We just use a farm of Docker instances. And the JMeter instances, we also keep that in GitLab, so everybody can also see who ran the test and who screwed up. So we now have complete follow-up on who executed the test, and we can see also in Splunk and follow up on how it actually went over time. Yes, and in this context, you had a, a database uh, service. Uh, you started to just create small scripts, create, read, update, and delete, and check the, the integrations. So it's rather small suites of test scripts. It's yeah. no, not massive frameworks. No, and it covers, it covers all my API calls and my functionality. So I can at least now say that my application is up and running in the test environments, and I have this performance over time. So when people blame me for bad performance of my application, I can say no. Because I have the statistics now over time. So I can now show that we have bad Splunk performance, but th also my response times over time for my different. This is uh, each and every test script actually running all over again, once a minute, creating a plot, a, 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 uh, some sort of heart rate of our service. So now we have both. The, uh, we push in the test log files from uh, JMeter directly into Splunk, but we also have our web logs from my application to measure against. So now we, have, we know when it's available and when it's not. So now when it looks like this, I know my application was down, and then I can try to figure out why it was down. And it also gives me interesting aspects to see how is my different uh, test environments behaving over time, and why are they not identical? So we can now try to troubleshoot and figure out and fix them. And here is a typical good example on uh, why all of a sudden did my application start taking three times the time for creating customers in one of the test environments? So it, it gives us lots of, uh, what could you say? It makes it a lot easier to discuss now if we have an environment issue or if it's what's an actual release issue. So in this typical case, it was an environment issue that we could figure out why it happened. And this is why this differs from the CI CD context, because that is built on what happens when a developer commits code, what tests are run then. This is continuous testing. So in the fact that things are changing when you're not committing code, you, you make people change and other people change in the same pipeline. There are dependencies, so you don't know actually when a change will happen. So, but if you test continuously, you will know and you will have more knowledge about, ah, this minute something happened. We didn't do anything, but someone else perhaps did. And you can start having valuable discussions about that, around that. So, as you see, this is a journey. We, me and Christian, we have talked about this and done this in a uh, uh, undercover way for a couple of, uh, for some time now. We have discussed, we have changed exchange ideas. We found our data lake. We started to adding data types and we started to create our own log files. But if you see it as a journey, it's never ending journey. Uh, we are still exploring the tools, and you're doing experiments on InfluxDB and Grafana, because perhaps Splunk isn't the platform that can serve every purpose. We need to ex see other ways of doing th stuff. Yeah, sometimes you want to see it in real time as well, not just by log files. So when we screw up, you want to see it immediately. So that's when we started thinking about using something but Splunk as well. So InfluxDB and Grafana seem to be an easy approach to do it. So we point the same JMeter script that we run to point it to uh, Splunk. We use a backend listener in JMeter to push it to Grafana to see immediately what happens. So we can plot graphs both for historical reasons in Splunk, but also have it in real time. But the main message is we can do anything with the tool set. We can, we can create magic, but if it's not driven by human beings being curious, asking relevant question, 
It doesn't matter what we do in the tooling ecosystem. It's all about the humans driving technology because they want to. They have the incitement to actually know more or make more precise decisions. But they have to have the data available for them. Yes. But in the end also, just recently, we, we, we found out that there is actually a small community in, in the development world that actually talks about metrics-driven development principles. And that is something that we understand that it actually matches our way of thinking. That production is unique, tests are not enough. Your mental model is not complete, you cannot understand everything. And it, code has no value. And that is really tough for people to understand. Code has no value. It has no value until it's put in production and someone uses it. So start measuring on that value. And if you can't measure it, you can't manage it or improve it. But you cannot measure everything. So pick out the things that you know you want to improve. Because it is basically about people having valuable discussions regarding what we want to create. And having the information available. So yes. one example is this one. When we uh, gave out all incidents and made them available when they were cleaned out from all personal data, which took us a while, uh, people started to use it to see what reoccurring incidents do we have across IKEA. And then we made it uh, possible to uh, filter by service incident types and working assigned groups so who ga got the job. So anybody could now filter on uh, what reoccurring incidents do we have today, last week, last month, and a history from now a year back. So we can see what systems do have issues and why do they reoccur? Because uh, before, we couldn't get that data out of our incident systems because we have too many incidents. But it's also made it possible for people to create stuff like this to see how many requests do we have compared to earlier. So create customer response or requests yesterday versus today, update customer, so we can see usage patterns of our application to see what happens and also CPU-wise, how my environment works over time. And another team created this one, uh, incidents trends over time for all IKEA uh, and over 12 weeks, 12 months, and just critical ones. Uh, problems, uh, what is the trend we actually solve our problems we create or do they keep growing? And our known problems PKs, what is the trends? So when we started making this data available to the common people, people started to use the data in ways we hadn't thought about previously. And that is the really interesting thing, is when people start to get an interest of data and start discussing, having discussions based on data. Uh, of course, we can show any statistic, but if it doesn't mean anything to people, it's useless. So, and the, I think the key thing was that people started to use it once it was available in things, in ways we hadn't thought of when we started making it public. Because we were just interested in what did the customer say or what did our clients for our system say when we deployed something to use the customers as our live testers, in a sense. Yes. And I think that was our last slide. Yeah. So uh, basically, I think we have a couple of minutes uh, if you have a, a question. Or if it was crystal clear. Or confusing. Or now I'm afraid. Sige. So what was the most interesting use of all the new I think the, the interest, most interesting one is that we can now compare test environments, how it looked like in the tests versus production, both uh, metrics-wise, transaction-wise, and response times-wise. 
And since it's available for both the testers and us running production, we can now see how the test was executed. So um, the emperor is now naked, sort of speak. There is nothing to speak about. The evidence is in the log file. So I think that's more the, the biggest win of this. There is no discussions anymore. Or it's the blame game gets to be taken away. Yes. It's, it's completely open. Uh, if you introduce a change and you see that I, I, I screwed something up for another system, I go and talk to them directly. I don't wait to get the call when someone is, is upset with me. Uh, I understand that there is a complex IT landscape. What I do has consequences and people understand that, embrace that and understand that we need to cooperate. So we are breaking down the silos. We are, through data, uh, making people interested in data uh, and also start working uh, in a more efficient way. And just the possibility that now that the project manager can now log into Splunk and see exactly how it went. He can look into the incident dashboard and visualize how did the deployment go. Oh, we had defects or we had incidents happening afterwards or we didn't. So it's that's the most interesting one that the data is now available for anybody to use. So it takes away the discussions. Minimize the the uh, the situation where people actually go and, and ask people how it went. They can see it for themselves. Making us available for making creating more interesting stuff, freeing time for us in order to asking more relevant questions. So the question was um, how we present data uh, if they're not prepared or not asking for the data themselves. Uh, perhaps this, this uh, Freedom Fries concept was, was first created uh, by you and a developer, and then it was shown to the development team. Wouldn't, it be, wouldn't you think this is, this is awesome to see? Uh, wouldn't you have help of this when people say, oh, your service is down? No, we're not. We have data. You have an opinion. Let's start talking. Um, it works for us, it works on my machine, why doesn't it work for you? Uh, having those discussions, uh, and I think it's an eye-opener. But it's a good question, because we have then built a certain set of dashboards, or the different teams, that we then try to reuse. And those ones is created in a public index. And those ones are freely available for anybody that uh, has access to Splunk. But that, of course, has to be requested and approved. But it's a public index, so everybody gets access to it as long as they have the guts to ask for it. Yes. So the question is about uh, speed of development. Uh, if it if it we have seen an increase in in speed of development. And the short answer is no, but we certainly hope it. But uh, it has helped us in to try to figure out when we have screwed up test environments at least. But we hope. Uh, our idea is to combine these tests with then uh, automated deployments, so we at least can run them together. So, uh, but uh, my primary concern has been from an uh, uh, operations perspective to try to figure out when the environment broke and what caused it. But that's the, that's the interesting part, if we can speed up development as well and make it more secure to fail faster. Yep. We're on a journey. So, uh, and this is not the entire picture of what is happening at IKEA right now. Uh, there are many other bits and pieces. Uh, so this is our little sandbox, you could yes. say. So. Any other question? We have just a couple of minutes left, otherwise. Ah. We don't have them. The question was about uh, sensitive information in the log files. Yes. Yes. And uh, the public one, uh, when we look in 
to the different data sources we push in, we take away all personal information uh, uh, because of uh, GDPR and Betriebsrat. So we, we try to only push in machine data into this public index. So we, we avoid anything personal or and IP addresses security related. If it has passwords, usernames in the log files, we remove them. So there's been, we usually try out all the log files in a hidden index primarily before we push it to the public one. But that's, that there's been lots of hours invested into finding <laughs> the wrong log files. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>